In the annals of Swedish crime history, the Keeler's Park murder stands as a haunting tale etched into the nation's memory. On a summer day, July 23, 1997, the tranquility of Gothenburg's park was shattered by the grim discovery of an unidentified man's lifeless body. The victim, cruelly shot twice with a pistol, was revealed to be Josef Ben Medor, a 36-year-old Algerian national and an openly gay man who had called Sweden home for many years. After months of painstaking investigation, the elusive perpetrators were finally captured. The culprits, Jan Notveit, the 22-year-old frontman of the extreme metal band Dissection, and his accomplice Vlad, then 20, also known as Freider Nemidial, now identified as Victor Draconi, were both musicians residing in Sweden. Notveit and Vlad, founders of the sinister satanic cult Temple of the Black Light, had disturbingly discussed the idea of human sacrifices before they committed their grisly act against Medor. But was their murder really committed as part of their satanic beliefs, as they have claimed? Or was a more real-world, bigoted motive behind their actions? Let's find out together. Black Metal, Satanism and Murder, The Killing at Keeler's Park On a tranquil summer afternoon in Keeler's Park, Gothenburg, Sweden, on July 23, 1997, a picturesque setting turned into a crime scene. A 16-year-old boy out for a leisurely walk stumbled upon a grim discovery. A lifeless body lying face down at the base of an ancient water tower. The police were promptly summoned, revealing a chilling scene. The man had been brutally shot twice, once in the back, the bullet piercing his heart, and then again in the head after he had fallen to the ground. Beside the body lay a bag and a head cap, but no identification could be found. The victim was later identified as Joseph Ben Medor, a 36-year-old Algerian national who had been residing in Sweden for a decade. Joseph was openly gay, and his frequent companion was a Finnish-looking man, presumed to be his boyfriend. Initially, suspicion fell upon the boyfriend due to their known tumultuous relationship, his lack of alibi, and his head cap being found at the crime scene. But despite the initial focus on Joseph's boyfriend, after 12 days in custody, he was released and clear of all charges. But this left a gaping void for the investigators. If it wasn't the boyfriend, then who had committed this horrific act? Assassination? In the turbulent backdrop of Algeria's civil war, a sinister web of violence and political unrest gripped the nation from 1991 to 2002. Amidst this chaos, an extremist organization known as the Armed Islamic Group of Algeria, or GIA, emerged with a brutal agenda to establish an Islamic state by toppling the existing government. In the midst of this civil strife, Joseph's lifeless body was discovered in Keeler's Park. And it soon transpired that the GIA, notorious for their ruthless tactics, had paid Joseph a visit just days before his body was found. Suspecting a political assassination due to Joseph's vocal opposition to the GIA, investigators initially pursued this lead. However, this path of inquiry proved equally elusive. Despite their efforts, the investigators failed to unearth substantial evidence linking Joseph's murder to the GIA's political motives. Frustration mounted as their new theory crumbled under the weight of uncertainty. Months passed, and soon hope began to wane. The victim. Born into a loving family, Joseph Ben Medor was raised by his parents in the heart of the Casbah of Algiers. Kind-hearted and intelligent, Joseph was known for his generosity and willingness to extend a helping hand beyond the ordinary. Despite not completing his formal education, he possessed a keen mind and was multilingual, fluent in both English and Swedish. His days were spent as a tailor, meticulously crafting garments for others. Anecdotes from his family painted a picture of his remarkable generosity. Once asked for a blender, he returned not with one but with six, exemplifying his extraordinary spirit. Life's twists led Joseph away from Algeria, when a friend invited him on the journey to France and the Nordic countries. Embracing this opportunity, he eventually found his home in Sweden, where he settled and built a life for himself. As we reflect on his life, let us remember Joseph not just for the way his journey ended, but for the way he lived, full of compassion, generosity, and the enduring impact he made on those fortunate enough to know him. May his soul find eternal peace. A major twist. In the chilling winter of December 15, 1997, a 23-year-old woman stepped into a police station in Stockholm, her face etched with fear and desperation. Her purpose was twofold, to seek refuge from her abusive boyfriend Vlad and to disclose a haunting revelation. Trembling, she recounted a macabre tale Vlad had confided in her, implicating him and his 20-year-old friend John as the culprits behind the Keeler's Park murder that had sent shockwaves through Gothenburg. According to her harrowing account, Vlad and John had lured their victim, Joseph, into their sinister trap during a chance encounter on the streets of Gothenburg. Together, they led Joseph to the eerie solitude of Keeler's Park. There, they attempted to immobilize him with an electroshock weapon, but their plan went awry. In a desperate bid for escape, 
Joseph sprinted away, only to be ruthlessly shot in the back by Vlad. As Joseph lay defenseless on the cold ground, Vlad passed the weapon to John, who callously fired a second fatal shot into Joseph's head. The woman, stricken with terror, also divulged that she knew the whereabouts of the murder weapon, a 9mm pistol, a crucial detail that shocked the investigators. Stockholm police swiftly reached out to their counterparts in Gothenburg, verifying that certain elements of her account aligned eerily with the crime scene, raising the chilling possibility that her gruesome narrative held the key to solving the Keeler's Park murder mystery. The darkness of that winter night was juxtaposed against the glimmer of a potential breakthrough, as detectives meticulously pursued the leads provided by the courageous informant, determined to bring justice to Joseph and closure to a grieving community, an altar of death. In a dramatic turn of events, the wheels of justice began to grind relentlessly in two cities, Stockholm and Gothenburg, as law enforcement closed in on the suspects linked to the Keeler's Park murder. First, the spotlight fell on Vlad, who was swiftly apprehended at his Stockholm residence. The arrest, made on the very day of the shocking revelations, was marked by the chilling discovery of a 9mm pistol, just as the woman had claimed, which was seized from his possession. As investigators delved deeper into Vlad's abode, they unearthed a macabre tableau. Among the eerie artifacts found were a satanic altar, fragments of human hair, bone pieces, a bottle filled with human blood, and a weathered skull believed to be the result of grave robbery. To add to the horror, a collection of films depicting human abductions sent shivers down the spines of the seasoned detectives. The evidence appeared damning, strengthening the case against Vlad. Simultaneously, the net tightened around Jan Notveit, the second suspect in this gruesome saga. Swift police action led to John's arrest at his Gothenburg apartment a few days later. The arrest of both Vlad and John marked a pivotal moment in the pursuit of justice, setting the stage for a legal battle that would unravel the dark secrets surrounding the Keeler's Park murder. Amid the fervor of these arrests, another unresolved tragedy lingered in the background. The unsolved case of Malin Olsen, a 16-year-old girl found strangled in a cemetery in 1994, who police also believed Vlad and John to be responsible for. However, they were never able to definitively link the pair to the crime, leaving a mystery that remains hauntingly open to this day. The Temple of the Black Light In the chilling depths of Stockholm's winter, a sinister alliance was unmasked, revealing a shocking connection between darkness, ritualistic beliefs, and the heinous crime that rocked Gothenburg. The arrest of Vlad and his accomplice, John Nodvite, shed light on the secretive world of the misanthropic Luciferian Order an occult organization founded in Sweden in 1995, also known as the Temple of the Black Light. Vlad and John were active members of the MLO, a group that delved into chaos Gnostic beliefs, seeking the true light of Lucifer through dark Gnostic and satanic magical systems. Their sinister practices included meditation, invocations of demons, and grisly animal sacrifices, particularly cats procured through classified ads. In the weeks leading up to the murder, the MLO, including Vlad and John, gathered at Notveit's residence to compile a chilling list of potential victims for their ominous human sacrifices. Among the targets were a defected MLO member, various bandmates of the duo, and even Notveit's own girlfriend. These malevolent plans prompted other MLO members to defect, refusing to partake in such sinister deeds, dwindling the active membership to a mere three individuals, John, Vlad, and Vlad's girlfriend. The motive behind this ghastly crime, deeply intertwined with the MLO's chaotic beliefs, remained shrouded in mystery. As detectives delved into the twisted minds of the perpetrators, the lingering question echoed through the corridors of justice. Was the murder of Joseph Ben Meduer a human sacrifice, driven by the dark tenets of Satanism, or a manifestation of an even more sinister and elusive force? The investigation, guided by relentless determination, pressed forward unraveling the intricate web of malevolence woven by the MLO and inching closer to the chilling truth behind this nightmarish crime. Dissection John Notvite was the head of a black metal band called Dissection, a pioneering force that blended black metal with melodic death metal. Dissection's unique musical style earned them recognition as one of the most important and influential extreme metal bands. To understand the motives behind this unsettling murder case, it's important that we touch on some history surrounding the black metal scene at the time, where a series of violent incidents marked the turbulent path of this subgenre of heavy metal. In the early 1990s, the black metal landscape was marred by tragedies, including the shocking suicide of Per Olin, the lead singer of the Norwegian band Mayhem in 1991. Olin's bandmate, Oystein Arseth, not only discovered his body, but callously took photographs and collected fragments of his skull, later displaying them at the Helvete record shop in Oslo. 
Tragedy struck again when Bard Faust Ithan, an associate of Arseth, stabbed a homosexual man in 1992, driven by homophobic motives. In 1993, Arseth himself fell victim to violence, stabbed to death by Varg Vikernes, a Norwegian musician known for his solo project Burzum. Vikernes, also facing accusations of church burnings, claimed self-defense, stating that Arseth had planned to murder him. Vikernes was sentenced to 21 years in prison in 1994, marking a grim chapter in black metal's history. The tale of John Notvite and Vlad thus became another grim chapter in the annals of black metal, echoing the turbulent and enigmatic nature of this subgenre. The Killer's Accounts In the early hours of July 22, 1997, Gothenburg's night was disrupted by a sinister incident that unfolded in the city center. Jan Notvite, along with his companion Vlad and two friends, found themselves in a chance encounter with a stranger. Joseph Ben Medor. The encounter occurred near a park known as a gathering spot for gay men, where Joseph approached John and Vlad, expressing his curiosity about Satanism. Initially trying to avoid Joseph's persistent inquiries, John and Vlad eventually invited him to John's home. However, upon observing Joseph's behavior and realizing he was homosexual, John and Vlad became offended and angry. When they reached John's residence, Joseph hesitated and refused to enter. Instead, John and Vlad proposed continuing their discussion about Satanism at Keeler's Park. Before departing, John retrieved a stun gun and a 9mm handgun from his home. Arriving at Keeler's Park, Vlad took the stun gun from John and used it on Joseph in an attempt to immobilize him. Despite his efforts to escape, Joseph's fate was sealed. Vlad seized the 9mm handgun from John and shot Joseph in the back, followed by a fatal shot to the head. Initially denying their involvement, both John and Vlad eventually confessed to their roles in the murder, providing similar accounts of the events. However, there was a significant discrepancy between their confessions. While John claimed Vlad had shot Joseph, Vlad insisted that John was the one who pulled the trigger, revealing the chilling details of a night that would haunt Gothenburg's memory. The Trial during the trial that followed the harrowing events of the Keeler's Park murder in July 1997, the motives behind the crime remained shrouded in darkness. The prosecution grappled with unraveling whether the act was a satanic ritual, a manifestation of the misanthropic Luciferian Order's sinister discussions about human sacrifices, or a hate crime fueled by the visceral anger John Notvite and Vlad experienced when confronted with Josef Ben Medor's sexual identity. Criminal Inspector Lars Olin, the driving force behind the police investigation, shed light on the complex motivations. Notvite, during interrogation, had initially claimed the murder was a sacrifice to Satan, but later withdrew this statement. Olin asserted that while Satanism undoubtedly cast a sinister shadow over the crime, homophobia also played a pivotal role. The Swedish police acknowledging the hate-filled undercurrent registered the Keeler's Park murder as a homophobic hate crime. In the ensuing legal proceedings, the Gothenburg District Court rendered its verdict on July 6, 1998. Notvite was found guilty of accessory to murder and illegal possession of a firearm, earning an eight-year prison sentence. Meanwhile, Vlad faced a graver conviction, found guilty of murder, violence against his girlfriend, illegal firearm possession, and possession of body parts, resulting in a 10-year prison term for him. Both parties challenged the court's decision, leading to an appeal. The Court of Appeal for Western Sweden deliberated and delivered its judgment on September 25, 1998. Vlad's sentence of 10 years was upheld. However, Notvite's sentence was increased to 10 years as well, solidifying the grim fate that awaited them behind bars. The trial, marked by its focus on the intertwining forces of Satanism, black metal, and homophobia, swiftly moved forward, driven by the chilling confessions of Vlad and John, each acknowledging their roles in the tragic demise of Joseph Ben Medor. What happened next? After serving seven years in prison, both Vlad and John were released in 2004. After his release from prison, John reformed his band Dissection, recruiting new members he felt could stand behind and live up to the demands of Dissection's satanic concept. They released a new album, but in 2006, Jan Notvite took his own life. He was found in his home, surrounded by a circle of lit candles, with a ritual book by his side. He left behind letters for his father and girlfriend, leaving a haunting legacy of violence and despair. Vlad, the other convicted murderer, seemingly moved forward with his life. There are unverified reports suggesting that he married his girlfriend. Under the alias Falsifer, it has also been claimed that Vlad may have authored several books, forming the Liber Falsifer series. But despite the passage of time, the details of his life after prison remain shrouded in mystery and ambiguity. Meanwhile, Joseph Ben Medor's remains were repatriated to Algeria, his home country. He was laid to rest in the capital city of Algiers, marking the end of a life tragically cut short.
Criminal Inspector Lars Olin, the dedicated investigator who led the police efforts, shared insights into the case through an article published in the book titled Nordisk Criminal Chronica 1999. He shed light on the perplexing details of the crime, including unexplained burns that were found on Joseph's back, adding an eerie layer of mystery to the tragic events. The story of the Keeler's Park murder remains a chilling reminder of the darkness that can consume human hearts, leaving behind a legacy of pain, confusion, and unanswered questions. Conclusion In the annals of criminal history, the Keeler's Park murder case stands as a chilling testament to the depths of human darkness. The heinous acts committed by John Nodvite and Vlad shook not only the quiet streets of Gothenburg, but also the very fabric of society, leaving an indelible mark on the collective consciousness. This harrowing tale serves as a stark reminder of the complexities of human nature, where the interplay of sinister motives, occult beliefs, and deeply ingrained prejudices culminated in a tragedy that claimed the life of an innocent man, Joseph Ben Medour. Beyond the gruesome details of the crime, the case raises profound questions about the human capacity for malevolence and the blurred lines between reality and the occult. In reflecting on the Keeler's Park murder, society is compelled to confront the enduring specter of prejudice and hatred that lingers in the shadows. It is a call to action, urging us to foster understanding, tolerance, and compassion in the face of ignorance and bigotry. By illuminating the darkest corners of our society, we can strive to create a world where such heinous crimes find no fertile ground and where empathy and acceptance prevail. May the memory of Joseph Ben Medor serve as a poignant reminder of the human cost of intolerance, prompting us to work tirelessly toward a future where every life is valued and where the shadows of prejudice are dispelled by the light of empathy and unity. Thanks again for watching this latest true crime deep dive. This is a case I personally had never heard of before and found it fascinating to explore. Obviously, metal music was a central focus during the Satanic Panic era, and as a metal fan myself, I actually find it quite disheartening to discover incidents like this that almost seem to prove the fear-mongering to be valid. So let's all keep in mind that individuals and incidents like those mentioned in this case no more represent metal music than any other horrific acts represent the religions, races, or cultural identities of those any criminal claims to be a part of. Let me know your thoughts about this case down in the comments. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss.